Hey guys, Ali, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This week's video is a highly requested one. It's gonna be all about our summer research experience as well as tips on finding a position because this is both of our first internships. Yeah, so we're just gonna run you through our experience and give you some advice for applying and everything will be timestamped down below in case you're interested in a specific topic. This week's video is sponsored by Pearson Canada. I've recently been using Pearson eText, which is their digital textbook. It's been a great resource for learning more about the basics of the fields of research that I'm interested in. They can be accessed on any device, even those that are offline and have many useful tools such as highlighting, a search function, and embedded videos. I also like how they're super affordable with prices starting as low as $29.99, which is great for college students like us who are looking to save money on textbooks. Make sure to check out their online store, link down below in the description box. So without further ado, let's just get right onto the video. Uh, <laughs> we do this every single time. <laughs> okay, so starting off with what we've done this summer. My lab was in the chromatin and genomic expression unit of the institution, and I was doing a project involving um, exploring the transcription mechanism in yeast. So my lab is in the division of cellular neurobiology, and Basically, I was also studying the effects of transcription factors, but this time it was like on stem cell differentiation inside the nervous system. So both of our labs are wet labs, and basically that just means like... You're like in the lab, you're at your bench, you're like pipetting, you're working with chemicals, it's like hands-on. Yeah, it's like when you think of like research in a lab, that's what you think of, but there's also different types of research. So there's clinical research, which is when you're working with like, like people. people, you're like testing drugs, like things like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's also dry lab, Re yeah. dry like, research, yeah. That's like if you're doing like bioinformatics, things like that. And I know a lot of people um, switch their projects over to dry research projects this summer because of corona. But Yeah, and like also in other fields like history or like geography, um, dry lab research is more common because you're like looking through other databases and other research papers and like other data that's already been collected to write your own sort of paper. Damn, IDGO. <laughs> so in terms of what we did more specifically in the lab, um, I learned a ton of new like molecular biology techniques that are very common in labs like running gels, running PCRs, running westerns. I worked a lot with like um, bacterial cloning, like plasmids. Things. Yeah, and like I did some DNA sequencing. Yeah, so my lab actually works with mice and I had, I got to experience like some dissections and like some working with actual mice, but I would say most of the texts that I did included sectioning with a cryostat, um, immunofluorescence, and then imaging with a confocal microscope. And yeah, I got really familiar with those techniques. <laughs> so what I liked from my research experience, obviously this is the first one for both of us, so everything going in is really new. Like the learning curve was pretty steep, but my prof was super nice and I feel like I definitely learned a lot throughout the summer. I also liked just like the feeling of independence once you got the hang of things. Like at the first week, my prof was always there like supervising me, but once I like learned the techniques and got them, then it was like, I could just like put my earphones in and do my thing. It was great, yeah. Um, I also think it's really interesting because a lot of the techniques that you do in the lab, you like learn about in class, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like you don't learn about like the specifics or like, the steps that occur inside the protocol and like why they happen in order to like see those results in the end. So it was really interesting like breaking down those techniques and like learning step by step how to go through them. And also there's like so many different techniques yeah. and like things you can do in the lab. There's so many different machines and I feel like I still don't know what like half of them do. Yeah. And yeah. During lab meetings, whenever like <laughs> the other members of my lab are talking about techniques that I haven't used yet, I'm like Yep, like I totally know what that is. So definitely, even if I feel like I learned a lot this summer, there's still a lot to learn, but I think that's another thing that I really liked about research, just like the fact that you're always learning. Yeah, yeah so we're just inserting a few of our pictures of what we do in the lab, like our benches, some of like, this like my gel station lab. <laughs> um, oh, my colonies picture, this is like, 
<laughs> Some bacterial colonies on a plate. Mm -hmm. So basically this summer, um, I had, my prof gave me like an actual project. It was like a smaller project within one of the bigger overarching projects in the lab. Um, but that was really cool because like I had the goal that I was working towards and I knew well, I had to do a lot of research in the field and everything, but then it was like the project was my own and it was, it was really cool to be working on it that way. If it's your first lab experience, there's really like people have a really big variety of experiences. Like I know some people who like their first job is just like clean the equipment and like <laughs> get coffees, which is like what you think of a t stereotypical like first interning. But like as Ife mentioned, like she did a full on project and I think like what I did was sort of like somewhere in the middle of that. I helped a lot with like data collection analytics, which is going to be used for a paper that's going to be published, hopefully. And the tasks that I did were like quite repetitive, but I feel like I really got to like improve at those specific skills over the course of the mm -hmm. summer. And also like my supervisor would always include me when he did different experiments. I got to watch him do a bunch of the other like electroporations or like cloning. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, there's not enough time for you as an intern really to learn all those techniques and get good, of the, at, good at them like in such a short amount of time. So it's sort of like I got good at a few techniques and was able to try out a few others. I think also research is just more repetitive than I expected going mm -hmm. in, I guess. It's not the right word, repetitive, but it's like you do a lot of the same techniques over and over again to get like different results, but like, you know, it's kind of the same type of process but it's not as scary as it seems mm -hmm. yeah and for all the techniques each lab has like different protocols that they follow mm -hmm. so honestly you don't really have to develop that much of your own like usually there's like a, a standard lab protocol and sometimes you like customize it a little bit to what you're doing mm -hmm. but most of the time my pi was just like <laughs> oh, like here's what here's how you do this and I just like follow the instructions. <laughs> just thought it was a lot more complex than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Like when you cuz research actually gets broken down a lot step by step in protocols and when you break it down that way, it's really like actually pretty simple, mm -hmm. you know? I feel like getting this experience in the wet lab was like a great learning experience. I just said experience like five times. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great learning experience and I definitely, I definitely like opened my eyes to yeah. like. Yeah, cause like before I just, we didn't really know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't really have a clear idea of what research was. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like reading papers or like, the, like that's not the same as actually being in the lab. Yeah. Like it's really different. So now it's like we, we have a concrete idea. Of what yeah, is, exactly. So. Well, I have a good question. Where do you see yourself going next with research? Well, in the fall, I'm actually staying in the lab that I worked in the summer, um, which I'm really excited about because I think like the longer you can stay in a lab, the more meaningful your work there because you can do longer projects and you can like see more results, things like that. And I actually want to go to grad school, um, which is why I think undergrad research positions, well, not the only reason why I think undergrad research is great, but definitely to get a taste of it before you actually commit to a whole life of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this was great, so yeah. So I guess on my end, I am planning to stay another month here in Montreal for September, but I do go to school in Hamilton, so like I, I have to, I can't like do a longer term project like Ife is doing. So I'm planning on going back home and maybe getting involved in some like clinical research, but probably just like as a volunteer. Okay, I'm hoping like please respond to my email. I'm participating in like a study they do, so I want to like help out and like learn more about the clinical research side. Um, that's what I'm hoping to do in the fall. Yeah, and that's cool to diversify too, you know, like mm -hmm. work in a couple different labs. A few people were asking about like the learning curve going in, especially if this is your first stint in research. And honestly, I would not stress about it. Like usually your PI or whoever is your supervisor is super nice, like they know well, you should definitely let them know up front how much experience you've had, and it's fine to say none. Just be honest with them about what you know and don't know, because if you don't know it, they'll gladly teach you, but if you pretend that you know it and then you mess it up, that's bad because like you're wasting lab resources. You don't come off great either. So yeah, like everyone is super nice in the lab. Like they want to see you succeed. Um, they want to help you out. They know you're an undergrad, like looking to learn new things. So. Can I pause? I can yawn. <laughs> 
I feel like those um, profs or postdocs or PhD students, whatever, who do decide to take on undergrad students know that like we won't be able to contribute as much as, yeah. at first. Like they know that we don't have that much knowledge. So the reason why they like took us on is because they're also willing to like teach and like help the next generation yeah, of scientists. That's a big thing in yeah. research, like nurturing the next generation of scientists mm -hmm. because just in general, research is always about advancement and you know, so they're keeping up that kind of like research spirit. Like some people might be thinking your internship in research has to be very like evenly transactional. Like they mm. teach you a lot, so you have to be contrib Like it'd be great if you're contributing a lot to the lab, but at the same time your PI or your supervisor totally understands that you're an undergrad. Like this is probably a lot of it is new to you, so they can't, you know, expect you to be coming up with amazing data right off the bat. Mm. So it's, for me, I definitely felt like I learned a lot more than I ended up contributing <laughs> back. But, you know, that's part of the process. Like, training yourself out into a researcher, the start will always be a little slower. Yeah. Usually labs are like around 10-ish people, give or take like three kind yeah. of thing. So. And the hierarchy in the lab is like, there's the PI, okay, I keep saying PI in this video and I realized we never explained what that was. PI is principal investigator, which is like the main- Like the lab director, Yeah, basically. it's the lab director and they like own the lab. So usually, yeah, it's your PI and then there's like some, if there's like senior researchers, it's like people who have been there for like really long time. And then usually there's like postdocs and then PhD students and then master students. And then, and then us. us. <laughs> We're at the bottom of the hierarchy. Okay, what else is there? Who okay. teaches, who teaches, who teaches slash you? Mentors. Honestly, most of the time, the PI doesn't do as much lab work. They mostly like write papers, apply for grants, things like that. They're, they're kind of there to like supervise what's going on in the lab because they've done their lab work, you know? They've been postdocs, they've been like researchers intently, and in now they own their lab and they're kind of just like, Chilling. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I think more often what happens like in Ali's case was that like a postdoc or a PhD student is your supervisor and you kind of just join their project that's going on. So there's many different ways where you can find research opportunities. I would say one of them is like talking to your prof like that you're taking a class with, like maybe going up to them after class or like sending them an email. But I think oftentimes there's a lot of students who wanna to talk to the professor after class. And especially if your class sizes are bigger, this can be a bit hard to do. So the way that we both found our positions is through cold emailing. And basically cold emailing is just sending out an email to someone that you like don't know, don't have any previous connection with, and you're just reaching out to them for the first time. A lot of fun, guys. Yeah. As some of you might know, cold emailing is a bit tricky because it's like hard to get responses. Low response Lo rate. Low response rate. I would say a lot of professors just like don't respond at all. And like out of the few who do, the majority will be rejections. But just keep in mind like if you feel discouraged that you really only need one person to say yes to get your first opportunity. And things will definitely get easier from then on because you already have some like basic knowledge yeah. of how research looks like. Yeah, um, the first one is definitely harder to get because you have to be upfront with them and be like, sorry, I have no experience. Mm -hmm. And to them, that's a big investment, training an undergrad, you mm -hmm. know. They have to put in the time, they have to find someone to supervise you, so, yeah. As in terms of like who to email, I think a good place to start is emailing like professors at universities, like at your local university, because I found that most of them are involved in research. Yeah, a good place yeah. to start, I think, is like your faculty website. Um, I know, I feel like most universities have this. McGill has like, for every, like if you're in biology or in biochemistry, like every department has a page with all the profs and then like listing what they do in their labs. So yeah, definitely that's a good place to start because all the information is there. So you just have to look through the different profs and there's usually a lot, a lot of options, mm -hmm. you know? A really popular question that we get is like what to include in these cold emails. So I think they can be like sort of broken down into like three, like not really paragraphs, like two to three sentence blocks. So the first one will just be like introducing yourself. And the second one, which I think is the most important, is explaining why you're interested in that professor's research. So I think definitely for cold emailing, it's quality over quantity. You really want to look into what type of research that professor does and make sure that you're actually like interested in what they're doing. So 
A, you like have a good time in the lab, and also B, that will definitely come through in your emails. Try to read some of their most recent papers or, you know, get familiar with the field they're working in. So when you're emailing, you sound like you're kind of informed about what they're doing. Obviously, when you read their paper, like most of it is going to go over your head because it's pretty complicated stuff that they're doing in labs. Mm -hmm. But it's good to show that you put in that effort and took that step to look up their paper and read through it. And if you can pick out like the key details of it, then, you know. I think that's really important. And I guess the third block would just be like a little conclusion and I always let them know that I'd be like open to a quick chat if they wanted to like get to know more about me or if, if they wanted to see like, yeah, like my personality and stuff. And then when we send out emails, I attach my resume and Ife also suggested attaching my high school tr transcript. Yeah. So I also did that. Like, cause we were emailing like in the fall of first year where we had no university grades, like none. So our university transcript was obviously useless, but even your high school transcript, especially if you had good grades, I think is like pretty helpful and convincing um, just so they can see that like if you have good grades and if you're a good student then that that's kind of like transferable to research you know? we also got the question about how many to send and honestly it's going to depend person to person um it is i would say a matter of luck especially if you're looking for your first position because you really have to find a professor who's willing to take on an undergrad i think the majority of the time the professor just isn't able to or like doesn't have the resources to or doesn't have space or doesn't have the time to take on a first year student and you really just to keep on looking until you find a lab where um, there is that possibility of them taking on like a younger student. It's good to try to send out a lot of emails to get a reply but also it's even more important to be doing that in the context of labs that you're actually interested in. Yes. And I guess the next thing would be like following up. I would suggest following up like maybe like three business days after you sent it because professors generally, like they also take breaks on yeah. weekends. They're, yeah, lots of yeah. press don't check their emails on the Yeah, weekends. so I would say give it three business days and I would say like two follow-ups max before. Yeah, like I would send what, one follow-up maybe. Most of the time if they didn't reply, I was just like. Yeah, because most of the time if they didn't reply the first time and you followed up, they the second time not. they were just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> they were like, no, heart. So, <laughs> so yeah. Honestly, as an undergrad, no matter what you say, you kind of are the same as all other first years, you know? Yeah. Not that much experience, like really eager. So we're all kind of in the same boat. It just really depends on the prof and if they're looking for it. Right? Also, like, who snatches the spot first. Yeah. It's, sometimes it's really about, like, who yeah. emailed first. A lot of people ask me, like, what do you, what can I do to differentiate myself? And honestly, like, nothing. <laughs> like, if you don't have that formal lab experience, like, it doesn't really matter what else you do yeah. because... I know some people yeah. are like, yeah, maybe you can include, like, course lab work. So if you took, like, an organic chemistry lab or things, which is, like, okay, those are a little bit experienced, but... When you compare it to mm -hmm. actual lab work, it's really not it's, yeah. the same. It's not comparable. So, like, you can include it definitely on your resume or anything, mm -hmm. but that's not a huge selling point, you know? And mm -hmm. most first years do have to take those kind of labs anyway. So, mm -hmm. again, if you're looking to differentiate yourself, that's not a huge... Yes. As for the timeline, I think that this is, really depends. Some labs are really quite flexible and are willing to take on an extra pair of hands like right away. Mm -hmm. But I would say most times um, the lab will need quite a bit of notice beforehand, especially if it is like um, if they're like up to their lab capacity at that moment. So I know in my case, I sent out emails in like November, I would say, like before winter break. And already at that time, I already got responses saying that, oh, I already have a summer student. And I was like, what? It's November? Yeah, it's always good to email early. Like, it's literally never too early to email, I feel like. Maybe, okay, don't email like three years in advance or anything. But if it's like October and you want to email about the summer, like, that's literally fine. That's great because you're kind of beating other people to the game, you yeah. know? So that means there's a greater chance of labs actually having positions. But also sometimes they'll be like, oh, we're not actually sure about our summer plans yet. Maybe mm -hmm. get back to us later. So mm -hmm. in that case, it's not like, it's a win neutral situation. Yeah, never hurts a try. Yeah. Um, in terms of timeline, 
um, as in when you should be trying to fit in undergrad research experiences in your undergrad years. A lot of people I know if they're doing a standard four-year degree, they kind of look to start doing research the summer after their second year. Yeah, honestly, it like if you want to get involved really early, that's great. If you want to get involved a little later, that's cool too. And people ask about like how many first years are involved in research. And I would say honestly, like not that many because it is hard to find positions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that I know that are like research assistants work in like the dry lab setting where it's more like data analytics, like reading papers and like, I maybe know like one or two people who are actually working in wet lab, but I'd say definitely as you get further on to your undergrad career, labs are also more willing to take you on as you have more like education experience because sometimes they're talking about like pathways in the lab and I'm like, ah. yeah. but yeah. On this topic, a lot of people asked about like high getting school. into research in high school, which I don't think we have that much authority to talk about because neither of us worked in a lab in high school. Honestly, I would say it's kind of hard Especially depending on the city you live in and how many universities mm. there are there and how many researchers are there. So as a high schooler, I would say it's even more difficult to get a position. But I mean, you can always try. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a lot of tips mm -hmm. <laughs> for that because neither of us did that. Um, yeah, I would just say it, like it never really hurts to try. But that being said it definitely will be much harder because like in most cases you can give back even less. Yeah, especially in like life science sort of research, there's a lot of knowledge that you need to know that isn't taught in high school yet. So it's like, unless you sort of self-learn and, and are really interested in a specific topic, it's gonna be hard to find yeah. a position. I think it would depend even more on luck at this point because yeah. you'd have to find a prof who's willing to take on a high school student. Yeah. But we don't want to be discouraging. There's yeah. always profs that there is. do want to take on high school students. So, I yeah, just like a warning, it definitely will be quite difficult. Honestly, once you get to the point where you get an <laughs> interview, your chances of getting in are actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Usually the interview is not like a job interview kind of thing where you're up against like 40 other applicants or whatever it's usually like they just want to get to know you <laughs> and like get yeah. your vibe mm -hmm. I mean I'm sure they're not saying that but like that's the general idea they just want to um, ask about you see your mm -hmm. interest in their research and you know and they sort of want to like know about like what your future plans mm -hmm. are and like how like the position at the lab can help you grow they want to see you succeed as well, so yeah. it's like they want to see how they can help you achieve your future goals as well. Usually they're going to talk a lot about what projects are going on in the lab. So it's not an interview in the sense that it's just like them asking questions at you. A lot of it is them informing you about the mm -hmm. lab, like mm -hmm. telling you about any projects that are happening or like explaining kind of the background of the field so you have a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually really informative, the interviews I found. Some people were asking about like how we found a position that's paid for this summer. Um, honestly, the whole volunteered versus paid thing. First of all, if you're gonna be looking for an internship in the summer, there's a lot higher chance that it'll be paid than if you're looking for one like during the year. First of all, cause like you're in classes mm -hmm. so you can't commit yourself to a full mm -hmm. full-time internship it's more like part-time part-time so then you're not really doing as much meaningful work yeah so they don't really want to pay you either and i guess one thing that people who like haven't done research like don't really know about is that protocols will take time like you have to wait for things to incubate you have to wait for things to grow i don't know yeah so like if you have like a two to four hour shift in one week, like sometimes you can't even finish one protocol. So definitely an internship where you have longer shifts and you have more time to do different things, um, I think will be more beneficial perhaps than just like volunteering a few times in a week. And that will be like mainly like 
cleanup, like yeah. organization, like administrative tasks that you'll be doing. Honestly, yeah. at this point, most internship positions in the summer, especially like at McGill or like in Montreal, are paid. It's not like amazing pay, but it's like pretty <laughs> you good. Can say that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, sometimes I'm surprised that they're paying us at all because, True. like, for the first like three weeks, they kind of just had to train us to. Yeah, it's we like, don't know anything, you know. Yeah, it's so like they're, they're paying us to learn, <laughs> which is great. Yeah, it was Great. No so. complaints. Honestly, even if it's just a volunteer position for the summer, because not all labs can afford to pay you. Mm -hmm. If you're in like a position where you can be doing research just without getting paid, I would still say go for it because research isn't really not about the money. Like I don't think anyone goes into research thinking like, oh, I'm going to do this to get rich. <laughs> like it's a really great experience, paid or not. I think it's a lot more about like what you learn in terms of getting an actual taste of research, learning new techniques, all that kind of stuff. So if you do want to increase your chances of getting paid or getting a position in the first place, it's really good to look for places with external funding or to apply to scholarships. That way your prof doesn't have to pay you. You can get paid from those external funding things. Yeah, and especially if you mentioned in your emails like in your cold emails that you'd be willing to apply for these external fundings that definitely increases your chances and makes you more desirable as a candidate to the prof. Yeah. I think another important factor that will help increase your chances is the time like the time that you're able to commit to the role. If you can work like full time that's great, but even if you can commit a certain amount of hours part time a week, that would help increase your chances over just like volunteering for maybe like one or two shifts in a week. Because to the prof, the more time you're willing to commit, the more worth it is it, it is for them to train you. Mm -hmm. Because training you takes a lot of hours, it takes a lot mm -hmm. of resources, so if in the end you're just only going to contribute like three to six hours a week, mm -hmm. first of all, you can't really do any meaningful, like what Ali was saying, especially if you're looking to do an actual project in the lab. A lot of your ex experiments have to be like sequential and follow up with each other day by day by day. So definitely if you're willing to t commit more time to it, mm -hmm. props will be more interested. Mm -hmm. So that is it for this week's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you guys found this helpful. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any more questions or just like comment them down below and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to give it a like, a subscribe down below and I'll see you all next week. Bye!